some people I've spent a lot of time studying, which are Cold War civil defense experts in the United States. And early on in the Cold War, they did modeling of um, basically attack scenarios in American cities, and they were highly mathematical. They looked at bomb yields, they looked at existing infrastructure, and then they made predictions about whether or not cities would survive nuclear attack. And the conclusion that they always came to was, of course cities will survive nuclear attack, and American cities will, within usually within a week, be ready to be back up to full production. And, and, and what they, then over time, I think realizing the inadequacy of that, they began to invite economists, psychologists, sociologists, and historians into these discussions. And so some of the modeling became tabletop exercise, uh, sort of qualitative kind of work. I think today, Pablo, your challenge got us to that next stage. I think if we're going to spend the rest of the day doing this, I would want to return to your eco-fascist North Korea, because I have a strong objection to that, actually. There didn't seem to be any kind of an index for economics, right? And this seems to me very odd, given the fact that most of the reasons why we have the policies that we do are at least sold to us because of so-called economic reasons. And there's also no indicator for disparity. There are things that are not easily included into modeling. And, I, and what does that mean for the policy options that we are considering if we look at sort of the real world where decisions are made based on these kinds of models? I think that is an important discussion. It's sort of different from saying that we can make <coughs> models more complex, because in some cases we cannot. Uh, even if we make reasonably abrupt decisions now to reduce per capita durable consumption, say, or per capita or population growth rates, um, it takes uh, several decades for the system to really become sustainable, at least in some parameters. Whereas the timescales for democracy, as it exists in most uh, in nation states, I'll borrow from her, uh, presently is, is of the order of about five or, five or ten years. It's a pretty large gap between this, the decision-making process in a democracy and uh, the physical response of the system. Mm -hmm found that uh, if we worked along coercive, uh, very non-democratic, individual liberty uh, indices of uh, making major controls on things, that it was fairly easy to come up with, to come up with uh, making the lines match. Um, but then that produces a whole set of other kinds of uh, you know, dystopian questions. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we pr uh, used uh, the principle of, of individual uh, decision-making power, um, and freedom, we found that it was much harder to achieve the kinds of results that we wanted. What is good about modeling overshoot is that you understand how things might be really bad while everything seems to be going fine. And that is actually the implicit assumption here, that we don't think that things are going fine in the world, mm -hmm. despite some uh, denialists claiming they are. Uh, and that's why we have the discussion, however hegemonic we might still think it is. But how do we get social sciences and humanist assumptions into the models? It's not the fact that we're not going to have assumptions, but that we can all agree on what other social assumptions that we are fine with. Do we have the same level of criticism of experimental science? Do we have the same level of criticism of epidemiological work? Um, so I really challenge us to use the same level of criticism to look at different forms of inquiry and different methods that we use to um, promote different viewpoints and different policies. Even though we were all native English speakers, we had a lot of trouble communicating between the um, historians and geographer on the one <laughs> side and the programmer on the other. And the way that we ended up uh, bridging that was that I um, started learning programming so that I could kind of bridge those two sides. And I found that that was really, really key. And I think that if we all knew exactly how this model worked, we would much better be able to interpret the things <clears throat> that we're seeing in it. Um, if you have access to the code, the entire model is completely transparent. But then I think where it becomes um, politically dangerous and what a lot of people have been kind of touching upon is that if you don't have access to the code, either because it's not made available or because you don't um, know how to read it, it's completely opaque and it looks like magic. Oh, what do you think is the appropriate role of critique? Is it just is it just debugging? Is it optimization of models? Or what would critique look like in the age of modeling of the Anthropocene in general?